Hello and welcome to our tutorial today. In this lesson, we're going to revisit and review some concepts in thermodynamics. My name is Victoria and I'm going to be helping you with this today. First of all, what is thermodynamics? Thermodynamics is a branch of chemistry that tells us about the energies involved in a reaction and it helps us to predict the potential of a reaction. So basically what we're saying is that thermodynamics allows us to describe the stability of a system and whether or not it will change. Now, it does not in any way describe how fast this change will happen or the rate of the change. That is a completely separate area. That's the realm of kinetics. One way I like to keep these straight in my mind is with an analogy. So if you can imagine that your friend calls you up and says, hey, will you come over to my place? The first thing you'll ask yourself is, oh, will I do that? Will this happen? Will I go to my friend's house? The second question is, how fast can I get there? Do I have my bike? Do I have to take the bus? Am I gonna walk? And these are completely separate questions. Will I go to my friend's house? how fast will I get there? And that's kind of an analogy that you can think of for thermodynamics and, and kinetics. So just keep that straight in your mind. Before we can get started, we have to just really quickly define some terms, the system and the surroundings. So the system is the reaction. Basically, it's what we care about. It includes all the reactants, all the products, and the medium. Everything else, everything that is not the system is the surroundings. If we had some liquid in a test tube and that was our system, that was what we cared about, that would be our system, and this would be our surroundings, everything else that isn't the liquid in our test tube. In biology, we often take our system to be a cell and the surroundings to be the matrix outside. So inside our cell would be our system, and then everything outside of it is surroundings. When you consider the system and the surroundings, that gives you the universe. We have three different types of systems that we talk about. We have open, closed, and isolated. And the difference between these types of systems depends on what kind of exchange can occur between the system and the surroundings. An open system is able to exchange both matter and energy with the surroundings. You could imagine that if we had a liquid in this test tube here, that it would be able to evaporate. Um, we might be able to add heat. So it can either be matter or energy, and it can be going from the system or onto the system. A closed system cannot exchange matter. It can only exchange energy. Okay, that's why we have this lid up here. And again, that can go either direction, either from the system to the surroundings or the surroundings to the system. In an isolated system, we have uh, no exchange of matter or energy. Okay, the last term is spontaneous, and this is kind of the heart of thermodynamics, but it's also kind of tricky too, because we use spontaneous in our colloquial language, and it doesn't mean the same thing as in thermodynamics. Spontaneous in thermodynamics means favorable. It's a very specific term. It means it's a process that moves from instability to stability from less stable to more stable. And remember that this can be fast or slow. The, the fact that something is spontaneous, this doesn't tell us anything about how fast it happens. The classic example of this is diamonds and uh, graphite. So diamond and graphite are both allotropes of carbon. They're just carbon atoms, but they're arranged in a different way. And the more stable formation of the carbon atoms is actually as graphite, not as diamond. So diamonds, in terms of thermodynamics, are actually moving towards graphite. But the thing is, we don't just see diamond rings turning into graphite all over the place because this process is happening so slowly. So in terms of thermodynamics, it's favorable for diamond to become graphite. But in terms of kinetics, it's so slow that we're never ever gonna observe this in, in our lifetime for sure. But you can keep it in mind because if anyone ever tells you that a diamond is forever, you can now explain to them why they are wrong. A non-spontaneous process is going to be the opposite. It's going to require an input of energy to proceed because it's not just going to do it on its own. It's going to be moving from a stable state to a less stable state. 
And in order to do that, we're going to need to input energy. Well, let's just think about that. Let's think about a spontaneous process here. So if we have energy increasing on this axis, then a spontaneous process will start at a state of higher energy, which is less stable, and it will become more stable. It will move to a state of lower energy. Spontaneous process moves towards greater stability. So you could imagine that if we had a non-spontaneous process, we'd be going the other way. We would be going from a more stable state to a less stable state. But in order to do that, we'd have to add energy to get it to get it up there. To measure spontaneity, we use this equation. And this involves a few different terms. The first term is G. And G is Gibbs free energy. Delta G, the change in Gibbs free energy, is the total difference in thermodynamic stability. So you could imagine on our graph that we had, we we're saying how big was this change? And Gibbs free energy, the total difference in thermodynamic stability, it depends on two factors. And those factors are included in this equation. So we have enthalpy, which is H, or the change in enthalpy, and we have entropy, the change in entropy. These are the two factors, enthalpy and entropy. This is what contributes to the total overall difference in thermodynamic stability. Let's start with enthalpy. In a nutshell, enthalpy talks about chemical bonding. So enthalpy is a measure of how strongly bonded a system is. A strongly bonded system, which is more stable, is going to have a low enthalpy. And a weakly bonded system, which is less stable, is going to have a high enthalpy. Typically it's a negative number, so a more strongly bonded system is going to have a larger negative number. So it's more strongly bonded, has a larger enthalpy, and that equates to a larger negative number. So the bonding that we're talking about includes both intermolecular and intramolecular bonding. So we have to think about all of those contributing factors. So we have covalent bonding, we have ionic bonding, we have ion permanent dipole, we have permanent dipole, permanent dipole, permanent dipole, and induced dipole, and we have induced dipole, induced dipole as the last one. And in terms of strength, because we're talking about enthalpy, we're talking about how strongly bonded a system is, we have a decreasing strength here. So part of what contributes to the overall thermodynamic stability, the Gibbs free energy, is how strongly bonded the system is. So the change in stability due to chemical bonding, the change in enthalpy. Now let's talk about entropy. Entropy is often described as chaos or randomness, but this is not how we want you to think about it. This is not the best explanation. Entropy is really a measure of the freedom of the components of the system to move. So motional freedom, uh, the stability that results due to motional freedom, this can have a, a, encompass a lot of different kinds of motion. So it can be the freedom to engage in different kinds of motion. That can be translational, rotation, and it could be vibration, but lots of different kinds of motion that we're talking about in, in a compound. It can be the freedom um, to move in any direction, or it can be the freedom to move independently. So there's all these different kinds of motional freedom, and entropy encompasses all of those. The greater amount of motional freedom that the components of a system have, this contributes to their overall thermodynamic stability. We see that in the equation for the Gibbs free energy. And also because it relates to the second law of thermodynamics, which we'll get to in just a second. I found it helpful to think about an analogy for entropy, and the one I think about is people in a gymnasium. So if you can imagine, that it's Imagine Day, and you and 800 of your closest friends have gathered in one of the big gyms over at the rec center. And your leader decided that it would be a really fun activity if he or she tied all of your shoes together. You can still move, um, it's just that you have 
fewer possibilities for how you can move, what type of movement you can make, what kind of ways you can arrange yourself. You certainly can't move independently. You would have very low entropy in this situation. What if we started to untie some of the shoelaces though? We would increase the freedom of motion. They would be able to move more independently. They would be able to rotate. They'd be able to vibrate by shaking their legs. They could move in any direction. Overall, there would be a greater amount of freedom of motion. We would be increasing their entropy. And eventually, if we, you know, we untied all of the shoelaces, then everyone would be able to move completely independently. They'd be bouncing around the gym kind of like a gas. They would have very very great freedom of motion and they would have a greater entropy. And we see this when we compare the entropy of molecules. So when a compound is in the gaseous state compared to the solid state, the gaseous state has higher entropy. Entropy is related to spontaneity because in order for a process to be spontaneous, like we said, to be favorable, the change in the entropy of the universe must be positive. So let's put these together. For a spontaneous process, the change in the Gibbs free energy, the change in the thermodynamic stability is going to be a negative number. And this signifies energy that's lost, that's transferred to the surroundings, which satisfies the second law of thermodynamics. And that's what makes the process spontaneous. We call delta G, delta H, and delta S state functions, which means that we don't care about the path that they take. All we care about is the final state and the initial state. We care about where you ended up and where you started. So in order to figure out the change in these values, we subtract the initial state from the final state. So the change in delta G would be G final minus G initial, change in delta H would be the same thing, H final minus H initial, and the change in delta S, entropy final minus entropy initial. I actually find that it's easier to visualize this like we did with the graph before. This is Gibbs free energy on this axis, and we have a process that starts at high energy, it is less stable, and it moves to a state of lower energy that is more stable, then our G final minus G initial is going to be less than zero. We can see that here, so that's our delta G. And that is what we said before, that's a spontaneous process. It's moving towards greater stability. So when delta G, the change in Gibbs free energy, the change in thermodynamic stability is a negative number, that means that the final state is more stable and our process was spontaneous. And similarly, if we went from stability to instability, remember this would require energy, then our change in Gibbs free energy is going to be positive. This is not a spontaneous process. It required energy. If we have no change, and remember it's a state function, so we don't care what path it takes. It could do something crazy, but as long as it, it starts and it ends at the same place and there is no change, then we are at equilibrium. We can visualize the same thing for the other state functions as well, for enthalpy and entropy. So you can imagine that if we had a graph of enthalpy, we could look at the difference between the bonding strength. So if we started up here, we'd have high enthalpy, which is weakly bonded, and that means it's less stable. And then we moved to down here, which would be low enthalpy, which is strongly bonded and more stable, then the change in enthalpy would be H final minus H initial, and that would be a negative number, a negative change in enthalpy. We can do the same thing with entropy. The sign convention is different for entropy, but we can visualize this as well. So if we have entropy on this graph, and we start at a high amount of entropy, we said that this was more freedom of motion, which is corresponding with more thermodynamic stability. So then if we moved to a state of lower entropy, then that would be less freedom, less stable. So you can see already how the sign convention is going to end up being swapped.
our change in entropy, entropy final minus entropy initial, is going to be a negative change in entropy, which is going to correspond to, in this case, decreased stability. So hopefully now you're starting to see how this all fits together in our formula. So since we said that the Gibbs free energy represents the change in thermodynamic stability and it tells us about whether a process is spontaneous, whether it's moving towards greater stability, and it depends on these two factors, on enthalpy and entropy, then we can see how these sign conventions play into helping us predict spontaneity. This chart here shows all of the different results of the different possible combinations of signs that you could have, whether you have a negative change in enthalpy and a positive change in entropy, and that tells you what will happen, whether the uh, reaction or the process will be spontaneous. This chart is not something that you want to memorize. It is something that you want to understand. What I would recommend doing is going through yourself and working through the different combinations. So for example, if we had, let's do the first one here. Let's say we have a negative change in enthalpy. So our system is becoming more stable, increased stability, and then our entropy is positive. We're getting a greater amount of motional freedom. That would be positive. And then we remember that temperature is in Kelvin, so it's going to be positive as well. Then we can see that our change in Gibbs free energy, our change in overall thermodynamic stability, is going to be negative. That corresponds to a spontaneous process. You want to go through and do this with every one of these combinations of signs. Think about what they mean. Think about what they're telling you about what's happening. Imagine the graphs and then decide using your sign conventions whether the reaction is spontaneous or non-spontaneous. And now all that's left is for you to go forth and practice. I hope you had fun today and I hope you learned a lot. Have a great day.